just turned into a big company. So for a startup, it really is that period at the beginning which is so, so rewarding for developers. So at AKQA, we're a digital agency, so we work with lots of clients. And the projects we work on uh, have share a lot of characteristics with an internet startup. So the way things work is some creative guys get together and I, I'm never there, I'm pretty sure it involves lots of beer. Uh, and they come up with crazy ideas and they get the client to agree to them and then they come and they say, hey Chris, can you make this work please? So then we have a similar sort of thing where we have a deadline. Uh, most of our projects run from idea to fully fledged product uh, somewhere between three months and six months. So, so it's quite similar to that sort of uh, startup initial process, except the fact that then we stop what we're doing, we, we start it all over again. So, this is a bit what our effort graph looks like. Uh, we move forward, the effort is somewhat consistent, we move towards the end of the three month period or the six month period, uh, or whatever that period is, we come across unknowns, and that effort that effort graph goes straight through the roof. So there's a problem here because in order to then fulfill the product, we can't necessarily throw people at it. Um, it's counterproductive often to throw more people, especially at the end of a project, uh, because you then have to communicate things to them. The communication overhead becomes so great that you actually lose productivity by bringing more people onto the project. So this is really what it looks like from a, from a project manager's perspective. Um, from a software engineer's perspective, uh, you can really substitute pain. Things get nasty at the end of a project like this. Uh, you work late, you're unsure of what you're doing, the risk goes up. You also notice that people become heroes. So the software engineers work late, you can see the amount of work they're doing is going up and up. Uh, the QA, the testers, again, absolute heroes. What happens is you see the bugs getting, getting checked in, uh, bugs getting tested, everybody's working like crazy, but when you actually look at the productivity graph, it's going down because of regression. So we find that actually, even though all this effort's going in, all this pain's happening, and all these people are so committed to the project and the company, we're not doing as well as we'd like. So what we want to do is we want to change this. So we want to see a nice linear line here of effort moving towards the end of the project. Um, if we have this linear line, then we can see that there's a constant involved here somewhere, because it's not changing. If we can identify that constant, then we can turn this into something that looks more like that. So the question is, how do we do that? Because I mean, typically you, you find that there are there are issues that you can't you can't encounter, you, you can't uh, you can't predict. Uh, there are things that you don't know are going to happen. There are unknowns. So what do we do in order to get our our curve down to this line? Well, it's all about predictability. The reason that we have that hockey stick curve at the end of the first graph that I showed you is because we cannot predict what is going to happen at the end of the project. We can't predict unknowns that come up. We can't predict. Uh, people going off sick, all these kind of things. So how do we introduce predictability? Well, firstly we, we think in terms of a lean philosophy. Secondly, we look in terms of having a culture of code craftsmanship. Thirdly, we look at continuous delivery. So, what do I mean by lean philosophy? So anybody heard of Eric Rice? Wrote a book called Lean Startup. So, Here's a quote from Eric Rice. Lean startup isn't about being cheap, but is about being less wasteful and still doing things that are big. So at AKQA, we're not interested in doing things smaller. It's, it's, it's easy to do things smaller. We're not, we're not concerned with being cheap either. We want to do things that are big, and we want to do things that are bigger each time we do them. That's what the company is about. So if technology can't support that, we've got a problem. So how do we go about being lean? Well, software engineers, are smart people. Software engineers are passionate. Uh, software engineers, uh, they produce software, that's what they do. Um, it's wasteful to have software engineers not produce software. Uh, sounds obvious, but we find that happens on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis. Um, I'll give you some examples. So the morning stand-up. Do you guys have morning stand-ups on your projects? Yeah? A few hands. Not you guys? No? Okay, so morning stand-ups, these are, these are good things to have. These are status checks uh, so that the team understands what they're doing. Uh, we don't do Scrum as such at AKPA, uh, but we do on all of our technology projects, we have morning stand-ups. So 
what I find sometimes happens with these morning stand-ups is that they roll on and on and on. So, I mean, I've, in the past, I've said, listen, what this morning stand-up is for is for the software engineers to say what they did yesterday, what they're doing today, and anything that is blocking them from moving forward. Those three things. This should be a really quick fire thing. This should be, this should be standing in a circle and going around and just basically bang, 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 bang. Well, what it often turns into is the project manager standing there with a circle around him or her, and the project manager wants a status check of everybody. So this is what they did yesterday, but in detail, with questions. Uh, so this is, this is very wasteful. This means now that the, the time it takes for the morning stand-up to telescopes out. Morning stand-up should be sort of five minutes or so. I mean, uh, turning it into a 30, 45 minute status meeting. Everybody apart from the project manager and the person who is speaking is wasting time. It is wasteful. They're thinking about other things. Because I tell you what, I don't care what this person got up to yesterday, and I don't care what they're doing today. What I care about is if they are not able to fulfill a dependency that I've got. I care about the blockers, and that's all I care about. This morning stand-up is not for the project manager to go around getting a full-on status check from everybody in the team. If they want to do that, they can go to the desk one by one after. The morning stand-up is not even about what you did yesterday and what you're going to do today. All I care about is problems. Tell me your problems, move on. Meeting invitations, just auto-reject them. Don't go to meetings, produce software, do what you're good at, okay? Automate it, just, if you don't know the person, just, just tell them you, you can't make it. Because I'll tell you what, the software engineer in a meeting, do they really need to be there? Is it project management stuff? Why would a software engineer need to be in a meeting? Okay, well, maybe at the beginning of the project, scoping, that sort of thing. You know, there are reasons, but if you take the stance that you do not attend meetings, that you question <coughs> that you're invited to then this can reduce waste enormously. People dropping by your desk. Can you spare me five minutes? It's never five minutes. Nothing takes five minutes, okay? Nothing takes five minutes. Uh, if it does take five minutes, then the person coming to your desk could have gone and figured it out themselves, okay? It's nothing takes five minutes. Now, not only does nothing take five minutes, but in fact, when you're engineering software, you get into the groove, your mind is into what you're doing. From experience, it takes about 20 minutes to get back into that groove again once I've been interrupted. Okay? Nothing takes five minutes. You don't have to be rude about it, but you can basically say to yourself that anybody who asks you for five minutes is asking for an hour of your time, at the very least. Okay. Doesn't, as I say, you don't have to be rude about it, but basically just ask them to schedule it in a different time, ask them to justify it, because nothing takes five minutes. Okay, everything changes. We saw that curve at the end of my initial graph. Okay, that's because things change. Things are unpredictable. You don't know what's going to happen. Don't waste time uh, designing things beforehand. You know, again, your software engineers. Just write code, design through implementation. This is what design patterns are for. This is what automated tools are for. Uh, this is to allow you to then design through code. Having said that, understand the difference between architecture and design. Okay? Don't dive in and start prototyping architecture necessarily because that can be a rather costly mistake. Um, when it comes to architecture, the one quote that I fall back on always is uh, Grady Bush. So architecture represents the significant design decisions that shape a system where significant is measured by cost of change. So forums are full of discussions about what constitutes architecture, what's the difference between that and design. Cost of change. It's, it's it's an easy thing to look at. How much is this going to cost if I want to change it later? I'll give you an example. Are we, are we putting this on the .NET CLR or are we putting it on the Java JVM? Okay, this needs some thought. You need to understand where this is being deployed to, other dependencies, these kind of things. This is going to be really costly if six months down the line somebody says, well, hold on a minute, guys, this is really not a very good idea. Let's refactor. That's going to be difficult. Okay, prototype responsibly. So, Again, the term prototype is overloaded, I find. People mean different things by prototype. So the uh, Pragmatic Programmer book. Is anybody aware of that book? Pragmatic Programmer? Great book. Everybody should read that book. It's not very big. It's fantastic. I, I like the way they talk about prototyping. So a prototype is a throwaway piece of code. You do not build on it. In fact, there can be benefits if you're prototyping to use a completely different platform to the one you're using for production. 
because this means that the manager, the project manager, can't rub his hands and say, hey, this looks awesome, we just need to tweak that, and that's, that's a piece of production code. Okay, the prototype is just throwaway. It's just a proven concept. However, you then have the concept of tracer code. So tracer code is to get an end-to-end -end, uh, uh, path, execution path, working through your entire system. So you do build on this. This is not broad, this is deep. Okay? So tracer code you would build on it is production quality code, but it's very lean. It just goes all the way down through all of the stacks. Don't build frameworks, for goodness sake, never works out well. If you, if you think to yourself you're going to build a framework, then um, ask yourself why. Who's the customer? Who's the consumer? Why are you building this framework? Frameworks emerge naturally. I think it was, uh, I can't remember who said it now actually, but they were talking about frameworks. And, and what you need to do is you need to allow the frameworks to emerge. So if you write some code and you find to yourself that this is really useful code, and in fact you start to use it on other projects, maybe it's a candidate to tweak it and turn it into a framework. Trying to build frameworks with APIs and second guess who's going to use what, who your customers are going to be, what they're going to use it for, it doesn't work well. So, documentation. You guys all love documentation, right? We all love documentation. Yeah? You want to spend more time writing documentation, right? It's kind of boring. Documentation is. Most documentation is a liability, it is not an asset. The reason for that, it needs maintaining. Okay, every piece of documentation you write, is it gonna stay constant a week down the line, a month down the line, six months down the line, phase two of the project where there's another team working on it. Are they gonna read this documentation? Are they going to see a representation of the system as it is? Or are they gonna scratch their heads because they can't understand why the documentation says one thing and they're seeing another thing in the system? Okay, do create architecture documents. Architecture, as we just talked about, is not subject to so much change. So do create architecture documents. Document the architecture, document things like areas of particular complexity or risk, things that you do have to figure out beforehand. Okay, there are, so you'll find some of these things, but generally speaking, your architecture document is the big blocks and the arrows that connect them together. Self-documenting code, okay. So one of my bugbears is comments. Uh, so we, we've cut back on the documentation, we said okay, we're going we're, we're gonna to keep our documentation in code. Um, that's a good place for it, okay, because the code does represent the system as long as you're deploying on a regular basis. If somebody reads the code and they understand it, then you've got the documentation of the system. It's self-maintaining documentation. However, I've said this before and I see all of these code comments exploding into the code. Well, unfortunately, code comments are subject to the same constraints as other documentation. You have to maintain them, okay? So if you write reams of comments in your code, are you really going to update those comments when you change the code? Well, maybe, maybe not, but maybe somebody else comes and work on it. It's not your code, it's the team's code, okay? In Java, you're not optimizing, usually, you're not optimizing for lines of code, right? So just split things out, give things, uh, uh, give things descriptive names. Make it clear what the code is doing, okay? If you're going to use a comment, use a code comment to express something that the code cannot express, not something that it does not express. If it doesn't express it, it can, refactor, rewrite your code. Make it so that people can understand the code that you've written. So, communication efficiency. You do need to communicate things to people. You need to share knowledge, okay? Uh, anybody heard of the ThoughtWorks radar? So definitely worth checking out, ThoughtWorks Radar. It's basically something that ThoughtWorks then uh, uh, releases uh, about once a year. Uh, and it talks about the, the technologies that they're using, what they're adopting, what they think is risky, these kind of things. On their radar is produce a technology radar for your own company. So that's what we've done at AKQA. So you can see here, this is one of our knowledge sharing tools. This here we've got uh, trial, sorry, we've got, I can't really see it there. Uh, we've got the docs, trial, investigation, legacy. So this means that anybody who's thinking of using a new technology, before they do any research, before they waste a whole bunch of time uh, reinventing the wheel, figuring out things that are AKQA technology we already know, they can immediately go to this diagram and take a look. Is the technology that they're considering here? If it's in a dot, it's a no-brainer. There's no risk. We know how to do this. We have expertise. Just go ahead and use it. If it's in trial, it means we think it's interesting. We've investigated it already. Uh, but we have limited expertise and limited uh, experience. 
If it's in Investigate, this means somebody has said, hey, this is cool. This is really cool. We should be using this. This solves a lot of problems for us. But we don't have any expertise and we haven't trialed it. So this is the period in which we have sponsors for, the, for this particular product. And these people will look at it. They will push it through the trial. They'll identify candidate projects to use it on. Here we have Legacy. Legacy is basically, don't use this, guys. We still support it. You may have reasons. For instance, ASP.net web form. So, uh, if you use particular um, CMSs, you are obliged to use these. We support them, but if you have the choice, don't use them. You guys can create similar things. The key thing here is that you've got a quick aid memoir. Keep it lean. Um, there's actually another page that comes after this where there's detail on all of these items so you can get further detail if you need it. So I mentioned at the beginning, culture of code craftsmanship. Here's a quote from Uncle Bob. Uncle Bob. You can't take pride and honor in something that you can't be held accountable for. Okay, so I've, I've been producing software in one sort or another for, for many years, and some software engineers, there's a tendency to be a bit defensive about their code. They don't want people looking at it. They write their code, if it works, it's their code, they own it, it's theirs. Um, I, I take the opposite view, complete transparency. I, I, I want to write good code if I'm writing code. I don't want to write crappy code. Okay, so if you can look at my code, if you can point something out to me that tells me, hey, you could have done this better, this is a good thing. I like this, I don't, I don't get defensive. I, I don't say, well, hey, you're wrong, I'm right, this is the way to do it, because I want next time to be able to write code where somebody looks at me and says, you know what, that's awesome, this guy can really code. It's all about transparency. So develop a green build mentality. Okay, I'm stating the obvious, right? Anybody here, hand up if you like red builds? Whoa! <laughs> We've got an adventurer. <laughs> okay, so, it's an interesting thing. Um, nobody wants a red bill, everybody wants a green bill. Uh, and everybody rolls their eyes when I, when, I, when I bring this up. However, if I go around and look at various bill consoles, various dashboards, what do I see? I see red here and there. And you know what? I talk to these people, the same people that put their hands up and said they like green bills. Okay, they so say, yeah, yeah, no, no, green bill is, is absolutely, you need it, absolutely. Oh, but in this case, uh, there was a reason for that. Oh, there was a reason for this. So here's an excuse. Don't worry about it. Just force the build. It'll pass next time. Okay, we see this all over the place. Um, seems like a good solution, right? You know, you know it's, a it's predictable. Sometimes it breaks, but then you just force the build and it works. Well, it's not predictable because you have absolutely no idea why this is happening. You don't know whether it's happening because you actually have a race condition in your code. You don't know if you've got... Uh, You've got a problem with your, with your build server configuration. You have absolutely no idea. Do worry about it. Figure it out. Make the time. You know, I talk to the guys. If, if you haven't got time, factor the time in. Talk to the technical manager. Talk to the project, uh, project manager. Make them understand. This is a problem. You have a fundamental problem. A red build means you fail. Um, yeah, here's another one. <laughs> Yeah, he got fired. <laughs> um, I mentioned it before, the, the code doesn't belong to individuals. The code belongs to the team. The team owns the code, okay? So yes, it makes sense often for the person who broke the bill to fix it. But sometimes, you know what? That just can't happen for one reason or another. You know, they may have been taken sick and gone home. What are you going to do? Leave your bill red for the rest of the day? No, it's, it's a team thing. You all need to just jump in and figure out what it takes to fix the bill and fix it. It doesn't matter who broke it. There's no finger of blame, everybody breaks the build. Everybody. Okay, here's another one, yeah. So we have a whole load of these builds in the console, and some of them are red, and they stay red. And you say, what are these doing? Oh, don't worry about it, Chris. Don't worry about it, it's always broken. Oh, you know, we're not even developing that anymore. So okay, fair play. I'm not saying that you take every project that's ever been, uh, ever been produced, uh, and, then, and then basically just try and fix every build there. But listen. If you're not developing it, take it out to the build console. Remove the build. If it's, if it's not adding value, it's detracting from it. Okay? Now the reason for this, it may not matter overall. The person speaking may be correct, it doesn't matter. But the point is, if I show you a page which is full of green, and then three days later I show you a page, and there's one piece of red on it, and I ask you what's changed, you can tell me immediately. If I tell you, if I show you a page with some red and some green, and three days later it's still got some red and some green, ask you what's changed, will you really be able to tell me? Maybe, but you'll have to think pretty hard about it. 
So it's all about reducing effort, re reducing effort and improving predictability. So, here's another one of my favourites. Okay, I'm, it's, it's the hero thing again. I'm looking at it now. It's, it's, it's complex, it's complicated. I'm working on it, I'm scratching my head, it works on my machine, which incidentally, one of these days I'm going to get a t-shirt that says it works on my machine, working in the office. Um, works on my machine. No, it's not going to take a while to fix it. It's going to take a maximum of 10 minutes. You know why? Because if it takes more than 10 minutes, back it out. Okay, respect for your co-workers. Every time that you keep the build red because you're working on something that you couldn't figure out why it doesn't work on your machine, you're preventing them from committing. You're introducing waste by doing this. Okay? And uh, I, I spoke to some guys at work, and one of the technical managers said, that's just not going to work. He said, every build takes more than 10 minutes to fix. Fine, back everything out every time. Okay? Nothing ever takes more than 10 minutes to either fix or back out. Just keep that build green. So we've got three rules here, my, my three build rules. Never commit on a broken build, fix broken builds within 10 minutes, and the entire team is responsible for the build. Okay, those three rules for me, they sum up the green build mentality, so I recommend keeping those in, in mind if you don't already. Okay. <clears throat> Seek constant peer review. This, this sort of looks at uh, some of the stuff I was talking about earlier with transparency. Um, you know, you're, you're working on a team full of smart people. Um, you can use that. Get, it, get, get into the mindset. It's your team, it's your family that you're working with. You know, you want to constantly improve. Do you want to be the best individual on the team and everybody else is done? Or do you want to be the best team in the building? Because I'll tell you what, I'd rather measure my team against other teams than myself individually against my team members. I think... Um, I think I find, it, I find it extremely rewarding working with people at AKQA and uh, I learn from them constantly. And sometimes you can learn from, uh, from different sources. It's not always the senior guys. You can have a junior guy, an intern, come in who tells you something new. So how to do this? Well, we don't pair program as a rule at AKQA. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, personally, I quite like the idea of pair programming. I think pair programming has value. I think a lot of the value associated with pair programming comes from training. Uh, comes from uh, basically leveling, uh, leveling the, the, the uh, playing field of knowledge. However, if you look at the way to effectively pair program, it's expensive to set up. Uh, you need to educate people in how to pair program effectively. It's not simply a matter of sticking two people in front of a computer. Um, you need to provision hardware. Uh, I've been to some ThoughtWork seminars. Uh, they take about, talk about how they do pair programming. So they have, they have a workstation with two monitors and they have two people sitting at that workstation. Each person has their own laptop. The laptop has the email and all this kind of thing on it. The workstation is interchangeable. It's true hot desking. So in order to set up pair programming at AKQA in this way, you know, we would have to look at the, uh, the cost of doing this. We'd have to look at the uh, uh, the the uh, return on investment uh, and that sort of thing. Um, there are studies which demonstrate that uh, you can increase efficiency and you can increase quality by pair programming, but there are, there are other uh, studies that show the opposite. So what I tend to do is recommend that you uh, target your collaborative effort. So in other words, if you hit coders block, then just find a colleague, say to the colleague, hey, can you, can you help me out here? And then pair for a while. This is a really effective way to solve problems. Um, if you don't do this, the, the, the problem is that the curve that we saw at the beginning sort of drops off uh, in the opposite direction uh, if we hit coders block. So the, the effort that you're putting in goes up, but the productivity goes down. And the longer you spend looking at this problem, problem, the less that you can find a solution to it. If you pass that day, you walk in the second day, you still haven't solved the problem, then you can just fall down a, a, a well of despair trying to, trying to figure this thing out. If you just take another perspective on this and spend maybe an hour, two hours pair programming together, you can get rid of the problem. So it's a cultural thing here because the person that you're asking to spend time with you, you're asking them to take time away from their work. So everybody has to factor this in in the team, the fact that they will be helping our colleagues, but it is a really effective way to, uh, uh, to solve problems. 
So it's not a sign of weakness to ask for help. It's not a sign of weakness to say that you don't understand something. It's, it's again, in the spirit of, of transparency, it's absolutely key that you just raise your hand. The thing that makes me feel really happy is when I hear a software engineer on my team say, hey, you know what, I'm out of my depth. I've been looking at this requirement. I, I don't think I can do this right now. I think this is a problem. Okay, the reason is that that's the right time to hear this. The wrong time is when he's written a whole load of code uh, doing something that he doesn't really understand. If he doesn't really understand it, he's not going to be writing unit tests. He's not writing unit tests, his legacy code already. It may or may not do what you want it to do. You've got a horrible refactor case on your hands there. Um, just encourage people to raise their hands. Encourage people to, to request help. Again, it means that everybody on the team needs to set, side, uh, set time aside in order to help their colleagues. But if you get into that culture, over the long run, it gives you that nice flat curve of predictability. So, code reviews. So this is a contentious thing. I was at uh, Agile London uh, a while ago, and we discussed uh, pair programming and, uh, and code reviews. Code reviews get a bad rep, and uh, I think there's, there's a lot of um, solid thinking behind that. It's difficult to do code reviews. Code reviews slip. Um, they involve somebody else looking at the code after it's been written, which you could argue is the wrong time. You would rather look at it while it's being written. However, if you're not pair programming, you can automate much of this stuff. You want to automate all of the static analysis stuff. If people are writing code uh, that doesn't uh, fit the style that you want written, you can pick that up through static analysis. If people are writing code with high cytomatic complexity, you can pick that up with static analysis. Cytomatic complexity is something that will never let me down. If somebody is writing a highly nested method with lots of lines of code in it, just refactor that. Break the build. Hey, tell them this is this is broken as build. This is crappy code. Okay, sort it out. Split it into other methods. You know. Once you get past that point, you can't automate everything in that way. We use we use a tool called Crucible. Uh, Crucible is an Atlassian product, uh, and this allows you to schedule code reviews, add comments, this sort of thing. Um, so if you integrate it with a product called FishEye, which is also an Atlassian product, uh, which keeps track of your subversion repository, then you can actually get coverage. So this means that you can generate reports which give you the coverage of code reviews that you've got. Um, in this way, you can treat it much the same way as unit test coverage. <coughs> so, increasing technical debt is difficult and no one wants to give you credit appropriate for our times, I think. Um, information radiators is just about sharing knowledge, it's about getting information out there. Uh, sharing information not only with your immediate colleagues in technology, but with everybody. So look further, further than technology. We work in silos to an extent, you can't get away from that. A project manager simply doesn't have the skills, he doesn't have the language that you use as technologists. Uh, we have people that work in client services, they, they talk to the client. Again, these people are talking in different languages. We have interns, we have different levels of understanding in the technology domain as well. So to an extent there's some siloing there. So respect your colleagues and talk to them in the sort of language that they understand. So that sounds difficult, right? You've got to think about this. Well, reduce complexity. So what does this mean? What does red mean? You know, my mother knows what red means. Red is bad, okay? Green is good. If you show somebody something that's red, they know it's bad, show them green, it's good. If you put that in the context of your project, it doesn't really matter what the problem is, it's raising a flag immediately, it's short, shortening that time, it's failing fast. Okay, so you've got unit test coverage that's dropped below uh, your required minimum. Does the project manager have to know what unit tests are? No. Do they know what red is? Yes. They immediately flag up the fact that there's something wrong with the project. So, it doesn't have to be visual, okay, it doesn't have to be red. Um, I was working on a project recently and we were having a problem with broken builds. There were too many broken builds and no matter what I said or what I did or who I spoke to, um, this was not reduced. We just kept having, having these broken builds. So we introduced a klaxon and it was a loud klaxon. I, I got, uh, got myself a spare laptop to run this. Um, I got some speakers, some powered speakers and I found a, a klaxon noise, uh, an alarm. And every time the build broke, this would go off and everybody in the room would jump out of their seats. And it was effective, I tell you what. The broken build dropped off. There's nowhere to hide when there's an alarm going off. You know, you, you, you can't just, oh, I'll, I'll try it. I'll see what happens, it's red, nobody's looking, so just fix it. Okay. No, there's a massive alarm goes off. And everybody says, well, who did that? Somebody has to go, well, it's me. Okay. So there's a lot of benefits to this because uh, 
Now, everybody knows in the room that, it's, that the bill was broken. So the 10-minute rule that I was talking to you about before, you may have wondered how you can enforce this. Well, if the klaxon goes off, what happens when the bill is fixed? I'm a fair man, so I got a round of applause with some whooping. Woo! So every time the bill gets fixed, uh, the round of applause goes off, and everybody high fives and feels good about themselves. So, you know, but you can tell immediately, if, 10 minutes, if, if more than 10 minutes has elapsed since the klaxon's gone, somebody can just go, hey, hold on a minute guys, who's fixing this? And then you can just back it out. Auditory information radios, radios it's very useful. So other than that, um, if, you're, if, if you want visualizations, what do you do? Well, we use Atlassian Jira. Anybody familiar with Jira here? Yeah. A lot of Jira fans. I'm a big Jira fan. I, uh, they, they, uh, they laugh at me at work because I've got a personal license which I run at home. Um, I promise I don't schedule things with my wife though. Um, yeah, Jira gives you a lot of stuff out of the box, so you, you, can get, you can get information radiating out of Jira. I mean, again, we can see here, this is green, this is good, this is red, this is bad. Do we know or care what this really means? Not at this stage, because we can just throw it back to the project manager. Uh, sonar. Sonar, again, excellent tool. Uh, you can configure it to uh, show the various different uh, uh, tests that you're running, reports. Uh, and you can Figure it so these boxes, the uh, size of the box reflects a different attribute. Um, so we've got Sonar, we've got Jira. Hey, roll your own, right? It's all just HTML anyway. So if you've got a bunch of reports that you want to uh, you want to cycle through, then just write some HTML, stick them in a frame. You've already got this stuff <coughs> being generated from your build. So obviously don't reinvent the wheel, don't rewrite Sonar. But if you just need to display something, just pop it in an HTML page. Of course, somebody needs to be looking at this stuff, so what you need is you need something hanging on the wall. You need a, um, a monitor hanging on the wall, ideally a big screen television, something that's visible everywhere. Uh, this is sometimes difficult to do in projects. I mean, requisitioning a big screen TV is not necessarily great. Um, so what I've done in the past is I've taken a smaller monitor uh, and I've hung it up and made sure that it's visible to everybody in the team. The key thing to me is that anybody walking past and just say, hey, what's the problem with this project? Because they see red. You know, the office intern, the guy delivering the letters, can just tap you on the shoulder and say, why is, why is this red? Okay, and you can say, well, I'm going to fix it now, sorry. Um, okay. So, continuous delivery. Continuous delivery. Um, so, Jess Humble and Dave Farley wrote the, uh, wrote the book with the same title, Continuous Delivery. Anybody read it here? No, it is a, it's an amazing read. It's, uh, it's a bit heavy. It, it takes some time to get through, but there, there's a lot in it. So Jess, Uncle Dave Farley, they say, reduce the time it takes from deciding to make a change to having it available to users. And they call this the cycle time. So, cycle time. How long does it take you to make a change to a single line of code and get it into a production environment? Okay. How long happens? Have to think about that. How long does it take you to do that? Because I've worked on projects where it takes six weeks uh, because of the process associated with it, because of the pain associated with deployment. So there's a cycle time of six weeks to have an idea that basically says, let's change this threshold from three to five. Okay? That's ridiculous. That's a problem that we can solve because when it comes to the predictability we were talking about earlier, if you can drop that cycle time, you can increase predictability and you can get stuff out quicker. So how do we do that? We create deployment pipelines. So what this means is we uh, chain together stages. We introduce the pipeline concept. We're all familiar with the pipeline, uh, pipes and filters, architecture. Uh, we understand pipelines. We understand how they work. So applying it to a, a build scenario makes an awful lot of sense. And this means that every time that you commit code, it's a potential release candidate. Because it's not your decision whether or not this gets out of production. It's, it's a business decision based on the functionality that you're developing. Okay, so enough of this, we've got a two-week sprint. So all this code that I'm commit, going to commit throughout that two weeks, this is not production ready. I'm going to tell you guys, I'm going to tell the business, I'm going to tell the project manager when I'm ready. And it's going to be at the end of the two weeks that this is our release candidate. No, every commit should be a potential release candidate. So how does that work then? So let's look at an example of pipeline. So the first stage of my pipeline is the build stage. So all I'm, all I'm concerned with here is just building uh, uh, build, build, building my, my code base. So I'm, I'm going to build it here. What I build is a release candidate. It's in 
these bits that I am producing as output from this build, this is the artifact that will make its way into production. I am never going to rebuild this version again. Okay, this is it. If it makes its way through the pipeline, it will sit in production. It won't get to another stage, and then I say, okay, I'm happy with this. Let's rebuild it for production. Okay, this means that at this stage, any configuration that you have for your application, any of this sort of thing, anything that varies by environment, that you need to be able to deploy that, um, or, sorry, you need to be able to specify that at deploy time, not build time. You, don't, you can't have a separate build for a different environment. Okay, the problem there is that if you have this, then stuff that's been tested is now untested. You, have, you could have differences in your uh, compiler optimizations, compiler versions. There are all sorts of problems that can creep in which give you hard to detect, hard to fix bugs in your production environment. So then we can have a unit test and report uh, stage. So I must say that this what I'm, what I'm showing you here is not a can canonical uh, pipeline. This is an example of a pipeline that we put together recently. I have arguments with, uh, or debates rather, with a colleague. He thinks that the unit test and report should go in the build stage. I think we should separate them out. Hey, whatever works for you. It's about, it's about producing software. Okay? So unit test and report, we can run these things in parallel. So we unit test, we get the code coverage, we get our code metrics, we produce our sonar reports. Any of this kind of stuff goes in here. So then acceptance tests. So, BDD, uh, is that something that you guys are familiar with? Do you, do you uh, behavior driven development techniques? A couple here, anybody else? A few people? Finding much success with it? Yeah? Okay, so this is something that we're starting to look at at AKQA. This is not something that we've been doing for too long. Um, it sits in our trial phase uh, in, in the, uh, the, the radar that I showed you earlier. And this is because we think it makes sense. We're starting to use it on projects, um, but we don't have lots of expertise in it yet. But the benefits here are, are that you, you basically, the acceptance criteria that you are writing is understandable by the business, the project manager, the client services guys, the software engineers, everybody through that entire arc. So this means that you can, you can make it clear when you're done, much easier. This is a problem that we've had otherwise. The software engineer says they're done. The project manager says they're not. I mean, who are you going to believe? You're going to believe the software engineer, aren't you? But, uh, it's, it, it, it's difficult to have a shared understanding of what's done. If you have human readable acceptance criteria that you're turning into executable code for tests, then it can be absolutely clear when you're done. When the test passes, you're done. Okay? If the project manager says you're not, hey, the project manager can use your change management process. He can introduce a change to the acceptance criteria, which will then turn into executable code, which will fail. You can make the change, and you can all agree that you're done. Um, so there are, there are some good testing frameworks out there. Um, we, we, we've looked at uh, Spock, I think. Um, I like the idea of uh, Cucumber JVM. Um, haven't looked at it in too much detail. The thing I like about it is that we work with .NET, uh, we work with Java, we don't really work much with Ruby, but we work with JavaScript a lot. So you've got Cucumber ports for, for, for all of these platforms. So this is really important because if you're educating people outside of the technology department, uh, to understand acceptance criteria written in a certain way, in this case, Gherkin, then what you would like is you would like them not to have to worry about what technology platform you're using. So I think there's a great deal of value to be obtained there. Integration tests. So the acceptance tests I would run against uh, mocks or stubs. What I'm concerned with is the code that I'm writing. Is my, is my system, does it fulfill the acceptance criteria? I'm not too concerned at this point whether or not I have integration failures. Move on to it. If it passes the acceptance test, then uh, let's run the integration test. Let's see if it actually works with everything when it's hooked up. So each one of these quality gates that you see here, each one of these arrows, it's automatic. So we're going to the integration tests. Uh, at this point, there will be no human intervention. This pipeline is all automatic so far. Um, and if any one of these steps fail, if you know that it fails there, it's no longer a release candidate. Okay, so the integration test pass, and we get through to the QA test. So this is manual, okay? So this is now a manual thing. This does not automatically run through these tests, okay? Um, the acceptance test and the integration test, I would be thinking of writing those at the controller uh, level, if we were using Spring MPC or something, something like that. Um, I wouldn't be looking at exercising them through the, the, the user interface. You could argue that, in fact, uh, you should exercise them through the user interface. You could use Selenium or a product like that. Um, I find these tests brittle. Difficult to maintain. Um, generally speaking, I would rather 
ensure that business logic keeps out of the presentation layer by governance uh, and test uh, and, and right, easy to maintain tests against the controller and otherwise. So then we get through to the QA test where these guys now, they will press that button. So immediately you've eliminated waste here. There's none of this uh, QA speaking to technology, hey, when can we have a build? Technology says, hey, you know what? Tomorrow afternoon, how's that sound? Okay, it's a bit late, tomorrow afternoon rolls over, so it's the following morning. QA sits around twiddling their thumbs. No, QA makes the decision. They decide which one of these pipelines instances they're going to pull down. So they can cross-reference this with, with, uh, with Jira, and they can see what's in this particular version. And then they click on a button, that will deploy for them. That will deploy out to the QA environment where everyone they can then test. Capacity test. Once we pass QA, we want to know if we actually, um, if, if, if the system performs well. So again, this is a manual stage. This is going to be potentially uh, uh, potentially expensive. This environment needs to be as production-like as possible. We want low balances and similar, similar hardware. We make it through to that, we get the deploy stage. Again, a manual stage here, and this means somebody who has the authority can then click on that button and it will push it out to deploy. This is a pipeline. This is build to deploy. Every single commit of the build stage is a potential release candidate, and we've got efficiency all the way through here. So in terms of number of tests, here's a testing triangle. I don't know if some of you have seen testing triangles before. I think probably Uncle Bob came up with the first one. Uh, mine looks slightly different. Now this isn't the order in which these uh, tests are run in the pipeline, but this is the number. So unit test, we want more unit tests at the bottom. Less, unit, less acceptance tests, less capacity tests, less integration tests, and less manual tests. This is a sanity check here. What you don't want is you don't have a big block, a big rectangle here. Because if you have a lot of manual tests at the top, this is going to cause you a lot of pain. It's going to take a long time every time we get to that QA process. If there's one problem that they find right at the end, you have to roll back right at the beginning, make your fix, make your one-line fix that I was talking about, and then you have to push it all the way through. So let's make these tests maintainable. So what does this look like to the end user? Well, here's a screenshot from, uh, from Go, Four Works Go. So you can see here, we've got uh, We've got our pipeline instances here with our different versions. So what I'm talking about here is if you, you've already deployed this, this has gone out. So if you wanted to go back, you can then click on this. This would deploy this version. So I mean, this makes it very easy for um, the business to maintain control of what, what it is that they're deploying. We've looked at others. We're, we're, we're currently evaluating different project products. Um, but this certainly indicates the kind of dashboard you would uh, hope to see. So maintaining infrastructure as code. You don't want servers to be works of art. You don't want uh, a situation where you provision a server and you, you hand out a spec and then some dedicated IT guy sits there and builds it for you for two days. Um, he might not know something, something may not be in the documentation. This is, this is not necessarily going to be the same as the server next to it. These days, I mean, you want horizontal scalability. You want to be able to throw hardware at a problem, not software, right? So in that case, you want every one of your servers in your array, you want that to be identical. Likewise, in your different environments, you want these uh, servers to be identical so that you understand, so you in introduce the predictability that you need to ensure that everything works okay. So production line, that, that starts with your development machine. So working with uh, one of our big automotive clients, uh, we found that we use, uh, we use Chef and Favorite. And what, what we do is we, we, we create a uh, development environment to deploy to on the local uh, development workstation. Um, and, uh, and we put that in a, in, a, in a virtual machine. So this way, instead of having this, this novel that I've been used to uh, reading when I start a new product, product project, sorry, um, which tells me what I need to install, what the, how I need to configure my workstation, and I go through this and it takes me two days, and I get to the end and I realize I've skipped a step or something and it just doesn't work. Instead of this, what we have is about a 15 minute setup time for every new developer that comes on board to the project. So all they have to do is they just run a script and then they just wait for about 10 to 15 minutes and their environment is set up. And it's production time. It basically means they can start writing code 15 minutes after they start on the project. Include all infrastructure. Wow, I've been stung in the past. Low balances matter, right? Um, so make sure that you include all infrastructure in this stuff. Um, web and application servers are good, but if, you're, if your system is low balanced, then you need to make sure that your uh, system works correctly behind a load balancer. The same goes for things like firewall ports, all these kind of things. And this, this needs to make its way all the way back down the, uh, uh, down the build pipeline. 
Look at cloud options as well. I mean, Amazon Web Services, this makes it a heck of a lot easier. If you can deploy to the cloud, um, this makes it a lot easier to, uh, to configure. So deployments, we talked about deployments a bit. Deployments are business motivated but technology led. What do I mean by that? Well, I've spoken to uh, project managers and they, they say no, no, they're, they're business led. I make the decision, I'm in control. I would dispute that. Um, so I ask them the question, what happens if every one of your technology team is off sick? Can you deploy? No. Okay, this is what I mean now. Technology led, you require a technologist. So what the business has is this, it's an intray, it's a request. Please technology, will you, will you deploy this, this application for me? What they need is that uh, big green button that they can slap when they decide that they want to deploy something. And in fact, as we talked about with the uh, build pipeline, what they really need is this. Um, because each step of these pipelines we are deploying to a different environment. The build stage, you want to smoke test to make sure that the uh, application you've, you've built actually works. Um, QA, capacity production, obviously you need those to deploy in order for an environment to test against. So, script everything. Um, this means that every environment needs to run the same script. You don't want to run a different script for the build environment than you do on the production environment. Okay, how often do you actually uh, deploy to production? Probably not very often. So the first time you deploy to production, do you want that to be the first time you've ever tested that script? Probably not. That's probably a recipe for failure because it's probably going to fail because it's a different script. So what you want is to run the same script that's run when you deploy in the build environment because this script has been tested hundreds or thousands of times before. So separate out your configuration, separate out anything that changes uh, from environment to environment and make sure that you use the same script. So production like all the way. Sometimes we find that with big clients we don't have access to the production environment. So when we deploy to production, what we're actually doing is, is producing a deployment package and we are, we are sending it somewhere. So that deployment package may consist of a zip file within which we have uh, an output from Jira, which, which basically says all the bugs that have been fixed, uh, all the tasks that have been completed, so everybody knows which functionality is in that release. Um, it may well be a snapshot of uh, subversion log. Uh, there may be some release notes which don't vary from, from uh, uh, from release to release, or deployment to deployment, rather. Um, if this is the case, okay, you're deploying to actual uh, execution environments during the build pipeline, the deployment pipeline. Um, what you should do is produce your script that builds the deployment package and run that at every stage in the deployment pipeline. So you build that, that deployment package. Once you've done that, you can then write another script which opens that deployment package and then puts it in the correct place and configures it correctly in your execution environment. So this is inefficient, right? You don't need to do that. You don't need to produce a deployment package uh, at every step of the way. But what you're doing here is you're doing the same thing in the same way that you will do to get it out of production. So this doesn't guarantee that it's going to run in production. What it does do is it takes it right up to your system boundary, your tested scripts, your automation, all the way to your system boundary. This means if there is a problem, then you know that the problem has occurred outside your system boundary, so it's a lot easier to troubleshoot. Okay, so that's really a, a snapshot of, of how we're doing things at the moment. Um, quote from uh, James Cash Penny, uh, J.C. Penny, American Department Store. Theory is splendid, until put into practice it is valuable. So I mean, a lot of the stuff I've been talking about, this is theory, uh, this is stuff that we are putting into practice, um, we work with fairly big clients, so some of these, some of these projects are not trivial. We're, we're not talking about simple campaign sites all the time, although we do get there sometimes. We've got Volkswagen, we build on top of uh, CQ5, we use LifeRay with Volkswagen. Um, there's an enterprise service cluster that we integrate with these guys, which, which reaches deep into the Volkswagen systems to bring data out. So this is, this is pretty tech-heavy stuff. Um, I put Starflare in there, it's not Java, it's .NET, but this was an awesome project. Uh, again, big distributed systems, uh, huge scalability for game servers, and of course Nike. Uh, Nike, we worked on the SDK, so this is a pure technology project. This, is, this isn't even creative. This was a, a project to make things easier for other software engineers. So all in all, I mean, the one thing that I would say to you is focus on predictability. Predictability is the thing that's going to affect your bottom line on projects. Thanks very much.
doing design for implementation. Yeah. Uh, could you please explain a little bit more? I am trying to say that uh, it's sometimes okay when you uh, try to juggle a car without two or two to write a code without even preliminary architecture. Okay, so the question was around uh, design through implementation. Um, so the question was, can I <coughs> clarify what I meant by that? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so no, I'm. I'm not suggest. I, I'm not suggesting that you would drive a car um, or design it, or try and create a car without designing it first. I think the key thing here is to differentiate between architecture and design. Um, the architecture is the way that the system is going to be put together. It's the, it's the cost of change thing. Um, how much is it going to cost to change what you're doing? So, is it really going to be useful to sit down before writing any code and write a whole load of UML which describes what you think you're going to do in the code? Um, have to think about how much it's going to cost you to change the code once you've written it. Because what you might find is you write your UML, it's not, a, it's not an efficient way to, to design because when you actually come to write the code, although your UML expresses something useful and you find that there is a constraint within the coding language that you're using or within the system, which means you have to do it slightly differently. So we have things like design patterns, for instance. So you solve the same problem, uh, or you solve similar problems over and over again. Uh, what I'm saying is often the best way to solve these design problems is not to draw boxes on the wall or is not to have meetings with your colleagues, it is to sit down and start writing code. Um, Test-driven development helps with this because what you're doing is it's not really about testing, it's about writing acceptance criteria for yourself, it's about describing what you are about to do in code and then doing it. And then the cost of change is you find you have to refactor after half, the, half a day's work. Well, we have refactor tools, we all know how to refactor the cost. The cost there is not great, and it's something we all know how to do. Um, to go back to some of the bigger stuff, um, yeah, sure, if you're deciding what platform to use, CMS is a, a prime example. No, you wouldn't want to dive in without thinking about which CMS you're going to use. Just pick one. Hey, let's use, uh, let's use CQ5, let's use Magnolia. Yeah. Bang. Three weeks later, you realise actually the product doesn't fulfil some of your requirements. Yes, that three weeks is costly because you have to throw everything away. Uh, so it's all about cost of change. Does that answer the question? Any more questions? Guys, do you have more questions? <laughs> My friend. <laughs> So the question is regarding startups. What is the most important? What should I be more concerned about when starting? What you should be okay. What should you be most concerned about when starting a startup? You should be most concerned with what your customers are actually going to want. So the market. Yeah. With the exception of Apple who make a <laughs> really good job of ignoring whatever the customers want to make it happen anyway. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan <laughs> um, Yeah, with the exception of Apple, it's, you can't tell people what they want. You can't, with a normal startup, you have to listen to the market, understand what they want and then give it to them. That would be the most important thing. A good book on Lean. Lean. Uh, Lean Startup by Eric Price. Yeah. There's also um, uh, Tom Mary Poppendieck. Uh, I would have to check the precise name of their book. Let me uh, let me find out that name for you. And I'll get that to you.